Pokemon Platinum. Came out in 2008, I played a ton of it as a kid, and Gen 4 is probably the one I put the most hours into. I wanted to replay it recently for nostalgia, you know, but it's Pokemon. If you've played it once, there really isn't much reason to play through again, so I made it a bit more interesting. I tried to beat Pokemon Platinum without ever having my Pokemon take any damage. Here's how it went. I named myself Ant, and the rival was the man, of course, and walked over to get my first Pokemon from Rowan. I chose Piplup. It starts with Pound instead of Tackle, which is great because it has 100% accuracy instead of the 95% accuracy that Tackle has in this generation. Then, the man wanted to fight. Just keep using withdrawal, please. Alright. <laughs> yep, took damage. <laughs> Had to reset. To not take damage fighting this Turtwig, it needs to withdraw six times in a row. And then miss two tackles. Barring a crit from Piplup, the chances of this happening are around 0.004%. So I threw myself at the battle over and over for half an hour until I quit. Well, with Piplup at least. I thought about it a bit harder, and it turns out Turtwig was the right choice. Fighting against Chimchar, it knows Leer instead of Withdraw as its non-attacking move. This means it won't make our attacks weaker each turn. All that needs to happen is Chimchar Leering four times in a row, which is a 1 in 16 chance. Much better odds. And on the third attempt with Turtwig, I lucked out and it happened. No damage rival battle. Leer again? Leer again! Yes! We're through! We've done it! After 40 minutes, I was finally able to make some progress. Talk to Rowan, nickname Turtwig, get some Pokeballs, and then we're free to have some fun. I can go right up to the next route, battle the first trainer who has a Starly with Quick Attack. Huh. Okay, it's time to start solving problems. What can you do to not get hit by a Starly that has a move that will always hit before you? Well, Turtwig literally can't. He learns no priority moves. I had to catch my own Starly. Here's how that went. Let's do it. Oh crap. He's Growl. Thank you! One. Two. Three. Yes! First try! I got lucky and caught it first try. Then I accidentally pressed the power button and had to redo it all, which took like an hour. Anyways, with the Starly in the party, I had to train it up until it could one-hit KO the opponent's Starly with its own quick attack. A quick attack KO is guaranteed once Starly evolves and gets to level 19, so I had to do some grinding. Grinding in this challenge isn't like normal Pokemon grinding at all. To guarantee you never take damage, you need to also one-hit KO every wild Pokemon. Unfortunately, the only attacking moves that Turtwig and Starly know are Tackle. And if I use those, there's a 5% chance that they miss each time. Getting to level 19 with Starly, I'll be using enough Tackles that I'm essentially guaranteed to miss at least once. So, I needed to find an alternative to training against wild Bidoofs and Starlies. The solution? It was found at night. It turns out, this route has a minor Cricketot infestation. At night, there's a 10% chance for a Cricketot to appear. And at this level, the little musical bugs only have Bide and Growl. Bide takes two turns to deal damage, so as long as my Pokémon can defeat the Cricketots in two turns, we're good to grind. But of course, Starly can't do it in two turns, but Turtwig can. So, I had to train Turtwig up, until it was able to one-shot the Cricketots, then I could switch train Starly until it could fight them. During this grinding, the chat and I decided on the full rules for the challenge. We decided that after each badge, I was able to save and if I happened to take damage, I could reset the game back up to the previous gym. We felt this stays true to the challenge because it's really about strategizing about how to make progress, rather than wasting my life away doing mindless grinding for hours. But as you'll see, I still wasted a rather large amount of time. Oh, and another thing. For mindless grinding, I sped up the game, because again, I'm not trying to waste my life fighting Cricketots for 30 hours. After exterminating the entire Cricketot population, my Starly evolved and grew to level 19. I was ready for the first battle. I completely stomped youngster Tristan with quick attack and was able to progress. It took 9 in-game hours to defeat the first trainer. This is gonna be a long one. In addition to Staravia, I had to train up Turtwig all the way to level 25 in this route to evolve and learn Mega Drain. It's the first somewhat okay grass move with 100% accuracy. This took an additional 9 in-game hours. From here, I was able to move up to Jubilife, I crushed the man with Staravia, and ran over towards Orbra... and accidentally ran into this trainer. Yes! Oh my god! Ah! That quick attack had a one-fifth chance to not KO, by the way. I really could not afford to make any more mistakes like that. 
With that over, I carefully navigated the route and cave to enter Orberg City and battle the first gym. I did the calculations, and my level 25 Grottle should just barely be able to take out Rorik with Mega Drains. Go Runk, baby! Oko, good! One hit KO! This is the one, this is the tough one! Oko, yes! Oh, thank god, okay. Just like that, the first gym was done. I made my first save point and was ready to move on to Floroma Town. This was where I made the discovery that made this challenge a lot more difficult. Team up battles. In these battles, you're forced to team up with someone else. And the people who you're teamed up with kinda suck. The first required team battle is with Dawn against two Galactic Grunts. These Grunts have a Glammeow and a Stunky. The Glammeow knows Fake Out. The only option is to quick attack to outspeed the Glammeow, as priority moves in this game all have the same level of priority, then hope the Stunky doesn't hit me. No matter what I do, it's essentially a 50-50 chance of getting hit. So I quick attack the Glammeow, which I miscalculated and it didn't even take it out, but the Glammeow and Stunky both attack the Piplup, enabling me to finish this battle first try. After that battle, it was clear my Pokémon needed to be stronger, so I trained up Grottle until level 32, so it evolved and learned Earthquake, then went to Floroma Town. Valley Windworks was next, and inside was Commander Mars. Her ace is a level 17 Perugly. It has Fake Out. To outspeed and one-hit KO the Perugly with Quick Attack, my Staravia needed to evolve and then get to level 40. I only had the first badge. I grinded against level 10, wild Pokémon, until I took damage, because I'm dumb. And that team-up battle that I did first try earlier, took three tries to get past again. Then, grinded for another two and a half hours, until Staraptor was finally a level 40, and I could defeat a level 17 Perugly. After saving Valley Windworks, I was able to move up into a turn of forest and, oh god, it's more team-up battles. In the forest, you are forced to team up with Cheryl. The first required battle in Eterna Forest is against Jack and Brianna. Brianna has a Pachirisu with quick attack. So I went into it, hoping for the best, and I got hit. So I went all the way back to the first gym, I did three hours of grinding, this time catching a Bidoof for HMs, and finding a diseased Very weasel. Nice. I put it out of its misery, of course. Then, I tried the fight again. Oko. Strike shot! Let's go! Yes! Oh. All right. All right. Finally. We're good now. And I succeeded. I beat the first required battle of the forest. Keyword, first. Fortunately though, the other battles I was able to force into single battles, so they weren't a problem, and I was able to cast aside the Blight of Cheryl. Returna City is the location of the Grass Gym, and because I had a level 40 Staraptor, I completely blew it away with a Wing Attack. The second badge was mine, after 33 and a half in-game hours. Not including the time spent in the resets, by the way. After the gym, I went back and caught a Buizel for later. 75% chance. Please! One, two, three! Big pogs. Let's go. Easily cleared out the galactic base, grabbed a bike, and the explorer kit. I cautiously traveled through to Hard Home, with a few uneventful battles along the way. The next big hurdle was badge 3 from Fantina, the ghost gym leader. Fantina has a Duskull with Shadow Sneak, a priority move then a Haunter with Sucker Punch, also a priority move. The Duskull was simple to deal with because Shadow Sneak couldn't hit my Staraptor, but the Haunter was trouble. Sucker Punch was able to hit my Staraptor, and Quick Attack couldn't hit the Haunter. So in order to beat the Haunter, I needed to train my Buizel to level 45 so it evolved and had the stats to defeat the Haunter with a single Aqua Jet. The final Pokemon, Miss Magius, was a simple crunch, and the third badge was mine after 46 in-game hours. With the third badge in the bag, this was where the challenge changed. I grabbed a gift Eevee, but the man who gave me some incredible advice. Make sure all your attacks hit, avoid every enemy attack. That's the strat. That's all you gotta do. <laughs> and walked into Salacian Town, confident as ever. Salacian Town has the Pokemon Daycare. The Daycare is what turned this challenge from a boring, grindy mess into a fun puzzle. If you deposit Pokemon in the Daycare, every step you take, your Pokemon gains one experience point. 
So all I had to do to get level 100 Pokemon was to shove them in the daycare and bike up and down over and over until I traveled around 1 million tiles. And that's what I did. I threw Staraptor and Floatzel into the daycare and off stream biked up and down for 30 in-game hours, or around 8 hours with the speed up. The next stream, I was ready to crush this game, or so I thought. I picked up my incredibly powerful level 100 Pokemon, swept through Route 215, until I encountered a very unexpected problem. Ace Trainer Dennis. He was an unavoidable trainer who had a Drift Blim. Drift Blims have the ability Aftermath, where, on the turn the Pokemon is defeated, if the opposing Pokemon made contact, it takes damage. This was a problem. My two level 100s only had moves that made contact. We scoured the game and strategized the best we could, and the best solution to the problem, barring extra hours and hours of grinding, was getting Rock Tomb and teaching it to Floatzel. In Gen 4, Rock Tomb only has 80% accuracy. It was a 1 in 5 chance that I would take damage. A 1 in 5 chance I would have to spend 8 more hours of my life biking up and down. Here's the battle. No! No! <sighs> Why? <sighs> Just one closer to 69, baby. Uh, I should have probably just done some extra grinding on my Torterra instead. But I reset. And since I'm stubborn, I just tried the Rock Tomb strategy again. Yes! Oh, it doesn't happen twice, let's go! So that was a fun way to waste 8 hours. With that fight complete, I moved on to the 4th gym, swept the whole thing easily, and saved the game. 73 hours in. Next up was doing a quick battle against some Galactic Grunts. With Dawn. The Grunts opened with 2 Zubats, so I can't Earthquake them with Torterra. I was a bit reckless here, because I had just finished a gym, so I decided to test my luck, taking them on without any strategy. I had to reset a few times until... Nice. This was the moment Chat and I decided to never make a single mistake ever again. So we came up with a foolproof plan to defeat the Zubats. I walked down to Pastoria City, went to the Move Reminder, and taught Floatzel Swift, which hits both Pokemon in double battles. With this excellent idea, I was able to defeat the Grunts without having to rely on good luck. The fifth gym was up next, and it was easy. Just Aerial Ace Crash Awakes Gyarados, Quick Attack the Floatzel, as it had Aqua Jet, and Aerial Ace the Quagsire. Five badges down, three to go. Before the 6th gym, I did have to run a few errands, like delivering the old charm to Cynthia's grandma in Celestic Town. I traveled through the foggy area on Route 210, and accidentally got into a battle. Of course, I had also forgot to use Defog, so I was going into the battle with a 40% chance to miss each attack. Fortunately, I had Aerial Ace for Scyther, but the Scyther knew Quick Attack, so I had to use my own Quick Attack. It hit. Next was a Luxio, which I was able to take out with an Aerial Ace. The final Pokemon was the worst case scenario, a Probo Pass. Both Swift and Aerial Ace would not take it out in one hit. Here's what happened. Don't miss. No. No! <sighs> ah! 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 <laughs> oh, that was lucky. The rest of the route, I smartened up and used Defog, so it was stress-free. I destroyed Cyrus in the runes, snagged Surf, and made my way to Candelab City. The man was waiting for me, so I Aqua Jet the Staraptor and Infernape, Aerial Aces Rose Raid and Heracross, and Quick Attack the Floatzel. Easy. Before the gym, I paid a visit to Iron Island to see Riley. To get the HM for strength, you have to talk to Riley. The thing is, all of the Iron Island battles are dreaded team battles. Fortunately though, Riley just hands strength to you right at the start and waits for you inside. So, I abandoned him and went right back to Candelab for the gym. The gym was fairly straightforward. I did need to pick up a Mystic Water in Pastoria, though, to ensure an Aqua Jet KO on a Scizor that knew Quick Attack. Other than that, though, it was a clean Surf Sweep for the 6th badge. Team Galactic started causing some chaos, so I went to Lake Valor, cleaned things up there, then Lake Verity because Dawn couldn't handle it herself, and up towards Snowpoint to Lake Acuity, uh, where it's hailing. But that's okay, because I had a way to deal with it. Remember the Eevee I picked up? By walking just barely into the hail on Route 217, and using Rare Candy on Eevee. It evolved into Glaceon, a Pokemon immune to the effects of hail. But it was still weak, and it doesn't learn any good Ice-type moves, so I chucked it and Torterra into the daycare to make them strong. The only powerful Ice-type move with 100% accuracy in this gen is Ice Beam. To acquire Ice Beam, 
you have to spend 10,000 game corner coins. 10,000 game corner coins cost 200,000 polka dollars. And I was completely broke after spending all of my money on the daycare. So I came up with a get rich quick scheme. Make sure Raptor hold a luck incense. Walk up to some snobby rich kids and beat them up repeatedly with the first seeker until the entirety of their parents' wealth is securely in my pocket. Then I blew it all on a single TM. With that done, it was just a matter of running up and down for another 8 hours. Once Glaceon and Torterra were level 100, I was ready to take on the Blizzard. I taught Glaceon Ice Beam and Shadow Ball, and went to the Move Reminder to get Ice Shard. The battles through Route 217 were straightforwards. I Shard the Pokémon with priority moves, Shadow Ball the Pokémon resistant to Ice, and Ice Beam the rest. Snowpoint City Gym was not as easy. The first issue was the puzzle itself. A few of the trainers in the gym have Snowvers, then Sneasels. Snowvers set up Hail with the Snow Warning ability, and in Gen 4, weather effects last indefinitely. Then the Sneasels have a Quick Attack, forcing my Glaceon to stay in and use a priority move. The thing with this is that Ice Shard or Quick Attack both don't do enough to KO a Sneasel. So I needed to find a path through the gym that avoided all trainers to not risk getting into one of these Snover Sneasel fights. It took a while, but after looking at a map of the gym for nearly 15 minutes, Chad and I were able to find a route skipping all of the trainers in the gym while solving the puzzle. Of course, that wasn't the only difficulty in the gym. We still had Candace. Candace opens with a Sneasel, which was simple. Since it wasn't hailing yet, we're able to outspeed its quick attack with Aqua Jet for the knockout, but Pokemon 2 is where things get more complicated. If Candace sends out a Bomb of Snow next, it starts hailing with Snow Warning. A Bomb of Snow itself can be taken out easily with Glaceon's Ice Beam and the Pillow Swine that follows it. But the reason that hail is a problem is because of Frostlass and its ability, Snow Cloak. Snow Cloak in hail makes moves miss one-fifth of the time. To guarantee the KO, I need to move on Glaceon that never misses. And as you can clearly see, Glaceon doesn't have one of those no-miss moves. Well, except it does. The hail here that causes the accuracy issue also solves it. As it turns out, Blizzard bypasses the accuracy check while hailing. So, I was able to Blizzard with 100% confidence and take out the Frostlass, nabbing me the seventh badge. I dealt with the Lake Acuity stuff, then wiped out the Galactic Headquarters, getting the Master Ball from Cyrus along the way, and headed up to Spear Pillar for the end of the world. Oh, you thought I was talking about the whole portal thing? No, it, it's another team battle. But for real though, this one was surprisingly easy. None of the opposing Pokémon, no priority moves. So Floatzel was able to surf, instantly drowning everything on the field. I hopped into another dimension real quick and caught Giratina with the Master Ball. It wasn't quite as strong as I needed it to be, so I biked up and down for two hours until it was level 66. I also beat up the rich kids again for money, for some stat boosting items, and a few TMs I'll explain later. Then, I was able to move through Route 222, only fighting a single trainer with a Wingle. Alright, Kuro level 100. Should just absolutely crush with the uh, aerial laces. Yes. No! Which I forgot had quick attack. So, I reset and got everything all over again. When I returned to the Wingle, I remembered it had Quick Attack this time. Now, onto the final gym. The opposing Pokémon are now getting to the levels where every battle needs to be meticulously planned out. Quick Attack the Jolteon with Staraptor to outspeed its own Quick Attack, Earth Power the Raichu with Giratina, Surf the Luxray with Floatzel, and, with a Silk Scarf on Staraptor, Quick Attack the Electivire to get the 8th badge. From here, it was a quick jog through Victory Road and a simple rival battle before the Elite Four Gauntlet. I taught my team some important TMs, leveled up Giratina one last time to restore balance, and went in. No going back now. The start of the Aaron battle was simple. Aerial Ace is Yon Mega, Earthquake to Drapion, Aerial Ace the Vespaquen, and Aerial Ace the Heracross. The Scizor, though, was trouble. Scizor knew Quick Attack, and it had enough defense where my own Quick Attack or Aqua Jet couldn't take it out. There were no priority moves that could defeat it in one shot. So, my solution was Giratina, who wasn't affected by Quick Attack. The problem with Giratina was that it was only level 69, and a level 69 Giratina couldn't normally defeat a Scizor in one hit. Well, not without Natural Gift. Natural Gift is a move that changes its typing and damage based on the berry that your Pokémon is holding. Give Giratina an Aka Berry, and Natural Gift becomes a 60 power, fire type move. So I did just that, and incinerated the Scizor, winning the first battle. Bertha was next, but with Torterra, the battle was simple. Giga drained everything except Gliscor, where you use Ice Beam with Glaceon. Flint was another simple one, surf the Houndoom, Aqua Jet the Infernape, surf the Rapidash and Magmortar, and Aqua Jet the Flareon. Lucian was next, an easy Shadow Ball sweep, except for Espeon, where I had to quick attack with Staraptor. The final fight with Cynthia was the most meticulously planned fight of them all. 
Glaceon's Ice Beam couldn't take out the Spiritomb in one hit, so I had to give it an Icicle Plate to deal just enough damage. Lucario had extreme speed, so I had to use Giratina. Giratina was leveled exactly to 69 and given just enough stat boosting items to outspeed. Giratina was also given choice specs, which I picked up in Celestic Town. So Earth Power just barely KO'd. I made sure Glaceon had enough speed to outspeed the Garchomp to KO it and Togekiss with Ice Beam. I taught Staraptor close combat to one hit KO the Milotic. Then it was an Ice Beam onto the Roserade to finish off the challenge and beat Pokemon Platinum without taking a single hit point of damage. 138 hours, 37 minutes, not including the resets. And that's how I did it. If you enjoyed this and want to see more, make sure to subscribe. I play games wrong all the time. And stop by my Twitch for the live experience if you're into that. But that's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.